So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, hair. And uh, these are my disclosures. I will definitely be discussing off-label use of Janus kinase inhibitors, but I hope to not have to say that in the near future when talking about the use of Janus kinase inhibitors in alopecia areata, at least. Um, so as we all know, there are multiple Janus kinase inhibitors. Um, however, the only two that are approved for use in the United States at this point are tofacitinib and ruxolitinib. Uh, baricitinib is approved in Europe, but not yet in the U.S. Uh, we've had lots of discussion about the mechanism of action of these drugs, so I'm going to move on to the um, talk about the types of hair loss. So alopecia in general can broadly be uh, divided into non-scarring and scarring alopecias, and I'll start with the non-scarring alopecias, which includes alopecia areata, whoops, which includes alopecia areata, as well as uh, some other uh, hair loss types like telogen effluvium, anagen effluvium, and also the patterned hair loss. We'll start with alopecia areata, which as many of you know is an organ-specific autoimmune disease targeting the hair follicle. And in particular, the anagen here is a tax which causes anagen arrest. It's the most prevalent autoimmune disease in the United States, and there are multiple variants. So uh, alopecia areata is characterized by an interferon response, which leads to reversal of immunoprivilege and permits recognition of the hair follicle by NKG2D bearing CD8 positive T cells. We also see the CD8 positive T cells. My pointer is not working. Where are we? We also see these CD8 positive T cells uh, distributed around the base of the hair follicle and uh, that's termed a swarm of bees. Dr. Cristiano and her group, oh, thank you so much, let's see. Dr. Cristiano and her group very ably um, demonstrated increase in uh, NKG2D stress ligands found in patients, human patients with alopecia areata as well as in the mice. And they also showed that these CD8 positive T cells um, are increased around or present uh, in the hair follicle and are attracted to NKG2D ligand. This led to preclinical studies looking at uh, potential use of Janus kinase inhibitors in alopecia areata in, in the uh, C3H uh, G hedge mice. Um, and they were able to show that um, use of the JAK3 inhibitor tofacitinib actually prevented uh, development of alopecia areata in these mice. You can see the wild type mice or the untreated mice who develop these patchy areas of hair loss, whereas the JAK3 inhibitor mice uh, have no hair loss. Similarly, ruxolitinib, which blocks uh, JAK1 and 2, was able to again prevent hair loss in the treated mice. Further, they were able to show that they could actually reverse established alopecia areata in the mice with systemic tofacitinib and also with ruxolitinib, although I don't show those photos here. Um, and they were able to show normalization of the inflammatory infiltrates following systemic treatment with Janus kinase inhibitors. Further, they looked at topical delivery of JAK3 of, of Janus kinase inhibitors uh, and were able to show that uh, they were able to, again, reverse long-standing alopecia areata by uh, a treatment of these mice with topical tofacitinib and ruxolitinib. All right. And they were also able to show uh, normalization of the uh, infiltrates. So this led to clinical studies in which we started with oral ruxolitinib to treat patients with alopecia areata. We did an open-label uh, single-arm pilot study 12 patients were enrolled initially. Most of them had moderate to severe patch type alopecia areata, two patients with totalis and universalis, and our dose of ruxolitinib was 20 milligrams twice per day for three to six months. We had multiple outcome measures, and we followed the patients for three months after treatment to evaluate durability of response. We also collected blood and, peripheral, uh, blood and biopsies for immune monitoring. I'm just going to show you a subset of the patients who responded to treatment. Uh, the first patient I'm showing is subject H. She had actually fairly mild patch type hair loss, but you can see at week 20 she has full regrowth. 
Uh, patient 9 had uh, essentially totalis, 95% um, salt score at baseline, uh, with excellent regrowth at week 24. And this patient had alopecia universalis for nine years prior to treatment. Um, and as you can see, excellent regrowth at week 24. So a summary of our findings were that nine of 12 patients achieved the primary outcome of at least 50% regrowth as measured by SALT score, um, which is a 75% response rate for the primary outcome, which is really quite a significant response. Um, we saw a response as early as one month. Um, and actually, eight of the nine patients achieved at least 50% regrowth by week 12. So the regrowth was quite quick. This is a graphical representation of that information. You can see patients starting fairly uh, high up with high SALT scores indicating uh, significant hair loss. And as they start to regrow, you see their SALT scores dropping uh, quite precipitously. And then you see the SALT scores starting to climb again once patient or patients are taken off treatment. We, as I mentioned, looked at biopsies in blood, and you can see um, these gene expression heat maps uh, showing that our responders at baseline looked very different from normal patients without alopecia areata. And then following treatment, our responders, their gene expression is starting to more closely approximate these normal patients. Another way to look at that is uh, looking at here keratin scores, interferon gamma levels, and cytotoxic T lymphocyte levels. You can see the responders at baseline with high interferon gamma, high cytotoxic T lymphocyte scores, low hair keratin scores. And then after treatment, these same uh, responders who are shown at baseline in red, after treatment in purple, more closely approximate the normal patients shown in black. These yellow balls represent our non-responders who uh, looked very similar to normal patients at baseline. So then we moved on to looking at tofacitinib. Uh, again, it was an open label study, single arm, 12 patients again enrolled. This time we enrolled a few more patients with totalis and universalis. We treated the patients for longer, for six to t uh, 16 months, started with tofacitinib five milligrams twice a day, and then based on what we were observing, we modified the study to allow higher dosing at 10 milligrams twice a day. Again, multiple outcome measures. We followed the patients for six months after treatment and again collected biopsies and peripheral blood. So again, showing a subset of our responders, uh, you can see this initial patient had uh, alopecia totalis at baseline with excellent regrowth at week 48. Uh, patient with moderate patchy hair loss at baseline, again, excellent regrowth at week 40. Uh, severe patchy hair loss at baseline. Uh, this patient actually responded to the lower dose of five milligrams twice a day, and you can see full regrowth at week 24. Uh, totalis patient with uh, good, but not you know, full regrowth at week 56. A moderate patchy hair loss with uh, excellent, but not complete regrowth at 48. And a patient with totalis with excellent regrowth at week 44. So the overall findings were that eight of 12 patients achieved at least 50% regrowth, which is a 67% response rate for the primary outcome. Again, an excellent response. Um, we also noted, uh, by the way, for both of these studies, no se severe, uh, significant adverse effects. Uh, the drugs were quite well tolerated. Uh, it should be noted in, in, our, in our tofacitinib study, um, eight, uh, seven of the eight responders did require dose escalation to 10 milligrams twice a day in order to uh, generate regrowth. And that's illustrated here. This is our early responder who started responding right away to the lower dose. And then you see some of the other responders did start responding, but not necessarily very dramatically. And then as we ab were able to increase the dose, you can see that these scores uh, started to go up faster. Um, reaching significance. And then again, as with ruxolitinib, you see the scores for regrowth uh, starting to decline as patients are taken off treatment. Uh, and again, the results uh, looking at um, hair keratin, score, uh, keratin scores, interferon, and cytotoxic T lymphocytes mirrored what we saw in ruxolitinib, which is that uh, patients at baseline looked very different from normal patients, so to speak. Uh, but as they're treated, they come down uh, to uh, higher keratin scores, uh, lower interferon gamma scores, and, higher, and lower cytotoxic T lymphocyte scores with treatment. 
Same thing seen, but the difference here is that this patient uh, at week four, when she was on the lower dose, had no change in her profile, but when her dose was increased, she also came down and looked more like these normal patients, which correlated with her regrowth. And uh, suffice it to say that there's uh, further work done by the Cristiano lab that does, again, show that, uh, oops, that CD8 positive T cells are the important um, cells in alopecia areata, and also they were able to uh, do some very elegant work that identified potentially another 114 genes that might be targetable mediators of this disease. I've just shown uh, these tables to indicate that the good news is at this point there are about 17 publications in the literature, uh, clinical trials, retrospective analyses, case reports, uh, looking at the treatment of patients with alopecia areata with Janus kinase inhibitors. Um, pretty much all of these have very positive um, findings, so uh, definitely uh, appears that Janus kinase inhibitors could have a very significant role in the treatment of al and management of alopecia areata. There are six clinical trials currently listed on clinicaltrials.gov, uh, but I know that there are cert many more in development, so again, uh, this is very promising. Uh, for the treatment of alopecia areata. I want to move on and briefly talk about patterned hair loss, which is uh, male and female patterned hair loss. Okay, uh, just going very quickly, very common type of hair loss, and the bottom line here is that um, there may be uh, additional roles for uh, Janus kinase inhibitors in other types of hair loss. So we know that with patterned hair loss, uh, there are changes in uh, duration of antigen and miniaturization, and uh, in you know, that results in shrinkage of hair and hair loss over time. And what's interesting is that um, Harrell et al. were able to show that topical inhibition of JAK-STAT signaling uh, resulted in rapid onset of antigen and subsequent hair growth. Um, uh, Legrand et al. Uh, actually found a little bit different results showing STAT5 activation in the dermal papilla was important for follicle growth uh, induction. Uh, which tells us that it's complicated. Um, there may be re many reasons why this uh, divergent response was seen, but the important message is that JAK-STAT signaling uh, may play a significant role in, in other types of hair loss uh, other than alopecia areata. And moving on to the scarring alopecias very quickly, this is like in planopilaris. Uh, lots of inflammation and parafollicular scale is seen. Uh, results in, unfortunately, permanent hair loss with scarring alopecia and loss of follicular ostia. Uh, frontal fibrosing alopecia is believed to be a different clinical variant, but um, related to lichen planopilaris. You see some of the same uh, areas of perifollicular inflammation. Um, let's see. And the biopsies of lichen planopilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia are identical. And most importantly, you see a lymphocytic infiltrate involving the upper to mid portion of the hair follicle, as illustrated here. And we do know that there have been multiple uh, studies that look at lichen planopilaris and indicate that there does seem to be a loss of immune privilege at the bulge region, um, and they can induce this loss of privilege uh, by treating uh, cells with interferon gamma. And this raises the possibility that these diseases may also be autoimmune diseases, and therefore may also be potentially treatable with Janus kinase inhibitors. And I'll just illustrate that quickly. So you may have, again, a very similar inf inflammation. It's just that with alopecia areata, it's lower down, uh, whereas with lichen planopilaris and frontal fibrosing alopecia, you're affecting the bulge and the stem cells, and destruction of the hair follicle therefore results leading to permanent hair loss. Um, we do have uh, many uh, talks happening, some of which will talk about uh, issues related to what I've presented today, so I encourage you to please go and uh, see those posters. And I want to thank my collaborators, colleagues, um, and these funding sources uh, for this work, in particular Dr. Angela Cristiano.